Okay, so I think everything is probably ready to go here. My name is Mark Jordan. I'm a community pharmacist based out of County Mayo. Today, for the Farm Buddy Forum and for Mark Jordan Pharmacist on um, YouTube, we're going to have a quick rundown through some of the main points surrounding the GDPR legislation that was brought in in and around a year to the day, about May last year, um, and the EU General Data Protection Regulations. So this is a short lecture that I produced at the time to give to some of our staff so that everybody was on the same page. Um, Everybody has my permission to use this video and disseminate it wherever you want to, um, you know, post it on whatever platform you want to, you're welcome to it. Uh, all of this information is verified with the Irish Pharmacy uh, Union, so it's all um, legislatively correct, for lack of a better description, albeit uh, through my own words. Um, none of it is designed to be used as actual legislative fact, so don't go and quote me go and quote the IPU um, or go and quote whatever relevant authority you want to quote. This is designed as a tutorial to um, enlighten and to educate and to uh, describe the various areas surrounding uh, the general data protection regulations that were brought uh, into play in May of last year. Um, and how it affects the pharmacy industry and uh, community pharmacy especially. So we'll have a quick rundown through it as I said. A lot of it is really wordy. I'm going to try and keep it as informal as possible. I will have to read from the slides in some instances which I hate doing but nevertheless uh, it's warranted I suppose in this uh, particular tutorial. So without further ado we'll uh, crack on. So the introduction. The long and the short of it is is that we have to tighten up the, our proverbial bootstraps or we're liable for the information that we um collect i suppose like as a as um as a kind of a side effect of community pharmacy we have to collect information um and the customer's information and what follows throughout this tutorial is a brief guide as i mentioned to what we can do as professionals to ensure we incorporate new data protection law into our day-to-day -day working so we're, we've experienced it now for what 14 months or 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 15 months or so and um and how it affects our day-to-day -day working. How do we maintain our compliance with the law? And how, just as, as I suppose a refresher, as there was a little bit of a discussion on it a couple of weeks ago on the forum, um, and I thought this may be useful, we'll have a, have a look at this lecture. Every member of society has the right to privacy and therefore privacy and protection of the inf information. So it's not something that I think a lot of people thought about until around this time last year and the relevance of the of their personal data and information. So you would have heard about horror stories of data breaches in the last 20 years of files turning up in bins, etc, etc. I wondered, I often wondered, did people realize the relevance of, of or the importance of their information? I think probably because I grew up with the internet, it, it made more sense to me that your information is important and it's, um, it's something that warrants protection. So this GDPR legislation is something that I personally welcomed. It's new legislation that was effective on May 25th of 2018, which is specifically designed to protect our data. The aim of this is to standardise the approach in which data protection and data collection occurs. There are clear and concise guidelines on what is expected in relation to data protection, particularly in, in terms of uh, professional experiences and professional um, businesses. This in, is of particular relevance in cases of personal information and the sharing of personal information online. One of the things that pharmacists, doctors, um, various other health professionals have to do is interact with one another and these interactions are usually in relation to a patient or nearly always in relation to a patient um, and when we're speaking about that patient we obviously have to share personal information so how do we stay within the parameters uh, of this GDPR legislation so in community pharmacy is what we're going to be um, concentrating on today community pharmacy has always been subject to data protection legislation health data so that's a, a, a primary uh, concern it's very very um specific data and it's very very personal data the responsibility of a pharmacy's compliance in relation to the proper maintenance of data is that of the pharmacy owner and the staff so we have to work cohesively the pharmacy owner manager and supervisor can be the same person and is often in contact with the staff the pharmacy owner can be another person who who owns the pharmacy 
um, a professional in their own right we all it doesn't matter where we are or what our position is in the pharmacy we have to work as a unit to ensure that uh, we maintain the uh, information um, and and um, data that is associated with our patients and customers in an appropriate manner therefore pharmacy owners and staff must ensure that all data is held securely and unless otherwise required by law is not shared or distributed to other parties inappropriately so that's something that we covered throughout this tutorial when it's appropriate to share the information and the particulars that go into the sharing of that information compliance with data protection law is overseen by the data protection commission which was set up in line with gdpr legislation implications of gdpr in pharmacy so what are the day-to-day -day implications Number one, breach of data. The Data Protection Commissioner is expected to have increased powers, and indeed they do, and therefore capable of imposing monetary fines on new data protection legislation. In lack of a bit, for lack of a better description, if there's a breach of data uh, found to have occurred in the pharmacy setting, the Data Commissioner can decide that a monetary fine is appropriate uh, in such instances. Uh, depending on the severity of the breach of the data, I would assume fines are expected to be as high as 20 million euro or 4% of annual turnover. Number two, pharmacies will be required to notify the Data Protection Commissioner in cases of data breaches. They will have 72 hours to do so via an online application, something that I'm a, a big advocate for as an error or of any description inclusive of data protection um, and a breach of, of that data uh, protection own up to it, put your hands up, contact the protection commissioner immediately. You have 72 hours to do so via an online application and go through due process to ensure that that, that breach is, is minimized and is clarified as soon as possible. So number three, patients have greater control over personal data. This means that the patients can request a copy of any relevant data to them at no cost. It must be furnished within one month of the request being made and they also reserve the right to the deletion of any data held in their name where appropriate. Okay, so in some instances in a pharmacy, um, it's necessary that we maintain the data, i.e. dispensing record, etc., etc. But a patient has the right to um, a copy of that data. A patient has the right to any of the data that is associated with their name. Number four, pharmacies do not have to register with the data protection or data commissioner, excuse me. However, it can be expected to show their compliance upon request by either the commissioner, the HSE or the PSI. So if either of those agencies turn up on your doorstep and they ask you for that information, which we will be used to throughout PSI inspections, um, you, you're obliged to hand over that information or to show them that information at their request. Interpretation of commonly used GDPR terms. This is something that um, I suppose is probably worth another look over probably once a year um, the data subject, consent, personal data and data controllers. Only the last day I heard them talking about GDPR on the radio and a lot of this was all mixed up and um, wasn't exactly correct. You know, it wasn't exactly wrong either, but a good um, interpretation or understanding of these commonly used GDPR terms means that you have the foundation for uh, making the right decision should you be asked for information in the future um, who you are and who, who the person is and what consent is, um, who's the data controller, etc, etc. So the data subject, any, identif any identifiable person who is the subject of the personal data in question, in this instance, it's our patients. Consent of the data subject, right? So these are bracketed terms that I've added in myself. It's just to clarify the actual um, commonly used term itself, so consent of the data subject indicates that he or she has given explicit, informed and unambiguous indication by a statement or clear affirmation signifying agreement to the collection or processing of their personal data. This can be written, electronic or an oral statement. So the consent of that is, is um, in, in instances where the person hands in their legal document, which is their prescription, they're consenting to you um, having uh, a collection or a process of or processing their personal data. This is written, electronic or an oral statement. So it's implied uh, by uh, giving in the prescription. But in instances where you have to share information, it could be more appropriate to get their actual uh, oral or oral consent. Personal data relates to any identifiable information pertaining to a data subject or patient who is or can be identified 
from the information or data that is in or is likely to come into the possession of the data controller. In this instance, we the pharmacies are the data controller. So we're data controllers, the data subject is the patient, and then the personal data is any relatable or identifiable information to that patient. The data controller, as I mentioned, um, is the pharmacy business and we maintain the data. So that's obviously, it's probably one of the easier ones to uh, to define uh, without having read over these um, interpretations of commonly used uh, terms. So data concerning health. This comes with three stars because it's a notable uh, point. This is the information relevant to a patient, the data subject, remember, which is related to their mental or physical health. This can include the provision of health services, which can in turn reveal information on the patient's health status. For example, the patient's drug history. So just to go over that again, okay, so data concerning health is any information relevant to the patient, right, the data subject, which is related to their mental or physical health. Makes sense. This can include the provision of health services, which obviously pharmacy is one, which can in turn reveal information on the patient's health status. So this this type of information is extremely, extremely, um, I suppose, valuable information depending on the, the application of the information. It's information that has a great deal of worth um, and it's very, very sensitive information. So it includes any provision of health services, which can in turn reveal information on the patient's health status. For example, if you have, take Mark Jordan, me for example, and Mark Jordan has been prescribed bisoprolol and Mark Jordan's job heavily relies on the fact that he is not prescribed bisoprolol. This is information that um, in turn can reveal um, personalized information on me and therefore um, is something that is extremely valuable and as I mentioned, extremely sensitive. And, the, and data concerning health is probably one of the highest degrees of data, um, one of the most important degrees of data. And it's, it's, it's something that we all have to um, really understand and really have a great deal of respect for. Data processor. This is the title given to the person and or company who processes data for the data controller. So the data controller is us. And in this instance, McLernan's or your dispensary system um, supplier would be considered the data processor. So the data processor in this instance, say, is McLernan's and we are the data controller. So they uh, process the information on our behalf. Recipient. In cases involving community pharmacy, the recipient would be the HSE or the PCRS. So we obviously have to share this information with HSE or PCRS upon the request in some instances and um, as part of our contract. These are considered authorities or agencies to which personal data is disclosed. It is inferred in the consent of the patient uh, to the data controller, the pharmacist, that we are going to give the information to the HSE or the PCRS as part of our contract so that we get paid, i.e. the top copy of the prescription in a GMS. Uh, script. Processing. In the case of community pharmacy, it is the collection, the recording, the disclosure, the use and the organisation of data so that we can dispense a patient's prescription. That is an all-encompassing um, sentence. It includes the data processor, the data controller, the data subject and it includes its own definition, processing. So um, I suppose it's a good culmination of everything that we've covered uh, up until now. Filing, any structured organization of data which is therefore searchable by way of name, address, etc. is considered filed information. Filed information may be electronic or hard copy. We have much, we have a lot, a lot, a lot of filed information on patients in pharmacies. We have hard copies of prescriptions which have been dispensed and kept on site. We have prescriptions waiting to be dispensed, so multiples of months. They, that's filed information. Then we have filed information which is electronic, which is kept by the data processor on our machines, i.e. McLernan's or whoever your uh, processor happens to be. That's filed information. Personal data, what is it? So personal data includes the following. So one of these 10 points or any of these 10 points are uh, concerned, uh, are, are considered personal data, excuse me. So name, address, gender, date of birth, marital status, PPS number, very important one, nationality, next of kin, phone number, and health information. So the two out of that is obviously health information and PPS number because 
because of those either or together or uh, solely you can find out everything else about that person that being name address gender date of birth marital status etc etc is all uh, is all relatable information but pps number and health information um, are the very very personal information and personal data any data specific to you or anybody else is personal data what is personal data and how do we keep uh, and what, what personal data do we keep so there are two primary types of data kept in pharmacies there's automated data and manual data so I mentioned those in our hard copy files and our electronic files and then there is other different types of um, manual and automated data that we keep so the first is automated data and that includes cctv cover and information collected as a result of having dispensed prescriptions number two manual data includes any paper records therefore any hard copy prescription which you're obliged to keep these therefore must be maintained securely and in a manner which means they can be easily accessed and sorted is our data important well obviously it is if it wasn't gdpr legislation wouldn't have been rolled out this time last year the data held in pharmacies is health related data and is therefore considered category one data so as i mentioned it's the highest degree of data this means additional controls apply and the first of which is data should be processed lawfully the second of which is it should be collected for specific explicit and legitimate purposes only only keep what you are legally um, obliged to keep number three relevant only to what is necessary as mentioned above the minimum required data should be kept number four the data held and the method of its retention should be accurate and up to date and number five the data should be maintained for no longer than is absolutely necessary a question of frequently asked on the form in relation to prescription so i added that in there um in hindsight the data held and how long it should be held is obviously dependent on the type of prescription and um, why you're holding it be it for um, uh, tax purposes or if it's going to be for lawful purposes in relation to retention of prescriptions in keeping with PSI guidelines and legislation it's it's obviously going to be affected so we have to make sure that it's absolutely uh, necessary to have it and that it's only there for no longer than is absolutely necessary the use of CCTV another bone of contention Pharmacies as retailers, same as every other retail store, are going to come into uh, days where they require their CCTV for whatever reason. When is it appropriate to hand over CCTV, be it inside uh, the shop or outside on the street, who is entitled to request it? That's what we want to cover here. So CCTV is a necessary expense in today's retail world. The use of CCTV in pharmacy setting must be, must be validated by either security requirements and or health and safety reasons. So, um, a lot of pharmacies have nice glossy floors unfortunately it rains in ireland sometimes it's important to have cctv um in other instances we may be on the high street theft might be a problem again necessary to have cctv as i mentioned the pharmacy must have a notice notifying excuse me the public that the use of cctv and it must also include the appropriate contact information for a person in charge in case a member of the public wishes to discuss its use if you use CCTV rolling in the shop, you have to have a sign saying CCTV, you've been monitored by CCTV, and also it must have information, relevant contact information. I would put down the uh, store manager's name and possibly the contact details of the store, and that way then uh, you're not in breach of your own information and you're not handing out information that you may not be um, confident or uh, happy to hand out. So the last point I have there is an important point. It's request for use or viewing of CCTV video by on Gardaí. Now, in instances like this, which is common, I suppose, in the retail setting, you might have some, some problem out in the street. Your um, front of shop CCTV might have caught something or it might be assumed that it might have seen something. In instances like this, it's not uncommon for the Gardaí to approach the shop owner and say, look, we need to see the CCTV. Since GDPR legislation has been brought in, a formal written request must be provided to the data controller, the pharmacy in this case obviously, requesting its use for investigation into a criminal matter. Now, it is noted that verbal requests from a member of the force followed by a fax of a written document and or the hard copy of the document will suffice in order to maintain a level of practicality uh, in instances such as this. However, you do need written requisition for your CCTV. Um, it has come to my attention in the past that uh, w without this, it has hindered proceedings um, in criminal investigations or 
various other investigations where the Gardaí are involved and there was no um, written requisition sent to the retailers. So it's very, very important from your safety and your point of view and also for, for from the Gardaí's point of view, um, it, it appears to be also very important. And um, I, I one of the things that I do like about this legislation that, that it does include uh, practicality and it does include instances of um, maybe it's not all that practical to uh, have a written request there and then so it is it does suffice to have a um, a verbal request followed by a written request cctv should be stored securely and for a maximum of one month which is 28 days this is the case except for during investigations of a theft etc anyone whose image has been recorded on the video system is entitled to seek a copy of the data from the footage Data can only be provided following a request such as this via a request form. Who does GDPR not apply to? Now, this is one thing that I have um, I've spotted most recently, actually, as, as I was referring to on on um, on uh, a radio interview, um, and it's it's something that's um, usually misinterpreted. Common health commonly health professionals will use information form. Uh, specific from specific cases in order to seek clarification and or guidance from peers this is allowed under the new legislation of course it is and anonymized information is not bound by gdpr rules so if you're speaking to a um consultant colleague about a various uh, a specific problem that an anonymous uh, patient of yours has you're entitled to do so what's also unaffected by gdpr is informational it is informational person personal to the deceased excuse me i'm getting tongue-tied here so a deceased member of the society gdpr does not um does not apply to that person in the pharmacy setting we are bound by our moral and ethical code even in cases of deceased patients to maintain confidentiality you're not bound by law but there is a moral and an ethical understanding that you do not speak uh, about any of the information that you uh, have come across in your day-to-day -day practice as a pharmacist or generally as a health professional and that's something that I think is, is very important from our point of view um, just as professionals. Now consent, data must be maintained securely. This means that the disclosure of information to any other person except the patient must be explicitly consented prior to doing so. However, in community pharmacy personal and professional judgment should be exercised in, exercised in regards to this rule. If you phone a GP and you want to speak with the GP and it's considered um, compatible with GDPR regulations, then that's fine. However, in some instances where you have to divulge the name and the particular issue and the problem, this patient is obviously a patient of the GP in these instances. You um, there is there is concern for the for the well being of the patient in instances like that, and it's to maintain the well being of the patient. So it's in the best interest of the patient that you and the GP discuss that particular person and their personal data. And in those instances, consent is not required. Explicit consent, a more definitive form of consent given in words. As a rule of engagement, explicit consent should be used when processing health information. In community pharmacy, consent is inherent in the patient giving and requesting a prescription to be dispensed. So that's something that's very, very important. Sometimes we can come across difficult difficult scenarios and this may be brought up um, by, by whomever. The consent is implied, as I mentioned at the top of the video, when the patient hands in the prescription. It is considered in such instances that the pharmacy has obtained the information in a fair and a legal manner. Again, it's the practicality of this legislation that I like. It, it understands that in all of these instances, it's unfair to expect us to continually ask for consent. Consent is implied in us obtaining the prescription in a fair way, which is a legal document from the, the patient, which is, which is what I think, again, as, is practical. Patients will be required to give explicit consent in any form of treatment provided, i.e. flu vaccination. And that's why we get them to sign the forms. Pharmacies require explicit consent if they intend on using personal data for marketing purposes. So obviously, if we want to say Jim got great relief um, from X, Y and Z that he got in our pharmacy and you want to use it on a promotional video, then Jim has to uh, give consent for his name and or image to be used in your promotional video. In these cases, we will obviously not be using information gathered from patient medical history. Obviously, you're not going to say, Jim came here with his prescription and now he feels better and this is what was on the prescription. Opt-in consent, consent obtained for electronic marketing, so your texts 
and your emails. There must also be an opt out option at the end of each message sent as part of a marketing campaign as a result. So your message says, please come to Mark Jordan's pharmacy to buy X, Y, and Z, 30% off with this message to opt out text 51052. Job done. But that has to be in every text message. Data access, is the patient limited in the request? So the regulations stipulate a small number of circumstances where the patient is limited in their right to access uh, their, their information. And these are as follows. Number one, the health or mental well-being of the patient may be at risk by obtaining the information. So as we can all imagine, there are certain instances where a patient, it may be best that a patient does not access their um, medical information. And that's where you use your, your professional discretion. Number two, the refusal of data access should then be recorded and reported to the superintendent pharmacist. A data protection folder is recommended and for these reasons it is validated. So I have a data protection folder and this is the type of stuff that I keep in it. If we have a patient who, um, for whatever reason, we don't give the, the information that they were requested to, you have to record it in there. You have to record that you spoke to the superintendent pharmacist. And then that way, if there's, if there's ever... Um, if there's ever a conversation about it in the future, then you can say, look it, this is why we didn't give the information. It was deemed um, it was deemed inappropriate and it wouldn't have uh, been good for the mental well-being or the health, the overall health of the patient in question. Therefore, we recorded it, had a, had a conversation about it with the superintendent pharmacist and that's how we came to that conclusion. So it's all about having the relevant documentation and all about uh, making sure that you adhere to the process and the legislation and, and the guidelines associated with it. Number three, and the final point is, if a patient believes information on the pharmacy is incorrect or inaccurate, they have the right to request it be rectified. That happens often. Patient comes in and says, oh, my address has changed since then, do you mind changing it? They're entitled to ask that, and that's never something that's ever a problem. Requests for data from patients should be made in writing and maintained by the pharmacy. So that's another important sentence. Requests for data from patients should also be maintained in your GDPR folder. Here it is useful to use a template requisition form. I mocked up some of those, printed them all off and keep them at the front. Now, in fairness, you're not going to use very many of them. It's not something that's often um, warranted. Uh, typically, people are very, very happy uh, to be asked these questions, uh, builds trust, etc., etc., and they're all they're all uh, happy in the in the knowledge that the pharmacy is doing their best for them. In some instances, it may be appropriate to record it. As I mentioned, this as mentioned, this copy must be free of charge to the patient and must be supplied within twenty eight days. When they come in and they request um, various information for whatever reason, they could be going for um, you know um, an, an elective op or something, and they need. Um, a copy of all the medication it's appropriate to keep a um to keep note of the fact that you gave out that information and they're entitled to it within 28 days of the request and they don't have to pay for that the data provider may be or provided may be electronic or hard copy hard copy is as easy as any just make a note of it and make sure that uh, the patient actually gets it i usually label it up as i would a prescription in the bag um, and label the front of the bag appropriately so that there's there's no chance of a breach of data in that hard copy heading out uh, to to the wrong patient a patient has the right to request the data be transferred uh, to another pharmacy both parties must comply with this request so if a patient comes into you and says, can you send all of my information to that pharmacy? I'm moving pharmacy. Um, this one doesn't suit me anymore. I moved away. Then you have to, you're, you're obliged to contact that pharmacy and uh, fulfill that request. Excuse me. Deletion of information upon request. Any member of the public can request a pharmacy delete information. This is a, a contentious one, um, particularly when we're talking about uh, patient medication records. This, however, is subject to discretion as a result. And with some cases, um, the reasons for such are listed below. below. So your the, the reasons where you can um, use your discretion, for lack of a better description, are as follows. Number one, it may not be considered in the best interest of the patient's health. If you have a very, very substantial, convoluted and comp complicated patient medication record, and you deem it more appropriate that somebody has that very, very uh, complicated record kept somewhere, then, you know, fill out your forms, keep it in your GDPR folder, speak with your uh, supervising pharmacist. It might be a case that uh, all of that information could be, you know, never come with a problem, come with a solution. You, it might be more appropriate to print off all of that information, 
um, n- notify your superintendent pharmacist, speak with their GP, get the consent of the patient and give all of the information to the GP and then delete it if, if, if they're happy to do so. That could be a way around that. Having said that, um, in some instances, it's appropriate to use your discretion as a professional. And number two, to delete data would be in breach of the med- medicinal products and control supply regulations or the mu- misuse of drugs regulations, which require they be maintained for a number of years. Obviously, we're beholding to various forms of legislation and make sure you're in keeping with those various forms of legislation. Data breaches. So what happens when uh, data is spilled out into the public arena? Personal data breaches are as follows. Access by unauthorized third parties, deliberate or accidental release of information by the data controller, computers or devices containing information being lost or stolen, alteration of personal data without permission, loss of availability of da- personal data. So they're fairly uh, self-explanatory. We can all think of a hundred different ways that um, data breaches could, could or can occur. In order to combat such bre- breaches, policies or standard operating procedures in relation to the possibility of an event occurring must be available. The superintendent must be notified immediately. A breach in data protection must be notified via the online system to the data protection website within 72 hours to the data commissioner. The breach must be recorded in detail, how it happened, the data subjects in number, the consequences of the breach and the actions to be taken to prevent further breaches. So um, if your SOP is in line and a breach occurs, then you must go back, review your SOP, it goes without saying it's the same in, in, in any instance of an error occurring in a pharmacy. The affected person or persons must be immediately notified where appropriate. I'd phone them first. Um, I, I don't know, is it just the way I am? I, I would phone the affected person first. The right to compensation is awarded in cases of data loss and breach of confidentiality where material and non-material damage is inflicted. The data protection folder, what do we need to keep in it? So we were discussing this as we went through it. Um, and it's fairly self-explanatory. Anything, in my opinion, that associated, is associated with the personal data of a patient, whether or not you give it to them or don't give it to them, you should record it. Copies of contracts, for example, the excuse me, contracts, uh, for example, the contract between the pharmacy and McLaren's and any other company with access to data, even if it is data even if the data is not personal. Records of data processing activities should be maintained, i.e. what is done with any gathered information and who has access to it. Staff training records on GDPR typically signed that they have been completed. So um, at the moment we're undergoing staff training, GDPR will be one of them and everybody signs in and that way then we know that they've been trained appropriately. The company staff confidentiality agreement, access request templates for members of the public or patients, a data protection checklist. So that concludes the actual uh, tutorial itself. It's something I suppose maybe, I don't know, did I come across? I geek out in some of this legislation sometimes. Um, I find it interesting. I think it's there to protect professional as well, um, as well as the actual patient and or customer. Um, but having said that, if your I's aren't dotted and your T's aren't crossed, uh, GDPR legislation is not to be messed around with. I think it's begun, going to become more and more important as time goes by. Um, I think it's uh, more and more relevant in terms of um, health as we move into the possibility of, you know, uh, different genetic disorders being rectified uh, pre-birth, etc., etc. All of this information is very, very sensitive and uh, as a result has a high value uh, associated with it. So it's up to us as the professionals uh, to work cohesively with our staff and with our colleagues to ensure that it's maintained appropriately. So um, I hope it didn't keep you too long. It wasn't overall too boring. Um, It is a little bit wordy. Thanks a million for everybody that interacted with all of the tutorials so far. This is uh, it's available on Mark Jordan Pharmacist on YouTube. It's also available on Pharmabuddy, um, the exclusive forum for and resource site for pharmacists, Irish pharmacists nationally. Um, my name is Mark Jordan, community pharmacist based from Mayo. Um, and thanks very much for tuning in. And we'll see you again for another tutorial in the series.